Judge's Corner is brought to you by CoolStuffInc.com and GatheringMagic.com. Support our show by visiting both websites. Now it's time for Judge's Corner with David Green. Welcome to Judge's Corner. In today's episode, we're going to be reviewing the mechanics of Return to Ravnica. And the reason for this is because when Judge's Corner first came out, uh, we weren't even out by the time Return to Ravnica was being released. So we never had a chance to review all the mechanics. And since Dragon's Maze includes all 10 mechanics from the Return of Ravnica block, we figured we'd hit the 5 that we missed. If you want to catch the episode that we covered on the Gatecrush mechanics, go ahead and click the link here. And without further ado, let's get started and review the 5 mechanics. The first mechanic is Tain, the blue-white mechanic from the Azorius Guild, Scavenge, the green-black mechanic from the Golgari Guild, Unleash, the red-black mechanic from the Rakdos Guild, Populate, the green-white mechanic from the Selesnia Guild, and Overload, the red blue mechanic from the Izzet Guild. So, let's take a look at the first mechanic, Detain. Cards with Detain say, Detain target non-land permanent and opponent controls. And what that does is, until your next turn, that permanent can't attack or block and its activated abilities can't be activated. So an important thing to note is with Detain, some things Detain target non-land permanent and some things Detain target creature. You really need to look at the card in order to distinguish what it can and cannot Detain. Uh, the next thing that's important to note is that it turns off any activated abilities the creature or the permanent might have. But what's the difference between an activated ability, a triggered ability, or a static ability? Well, you can identify an activated ability by looking for the colon. Anything with an activated ability is going to have a cost, followed by a colon, and then finally an effect. Something like tap, colon, effect, or sacrifice a permanent, colon, effect. Uh, so let's get the ball rolling a little further by taking a look at the next example, which is going to be what happens if you try to detain something with the ability already on the stack? So in our first example, I'm being targeted by a Lava Crew's effect to deal me one damage. But I control an Azorius Arrestor and I want to try to stop that Lava Crew. So I play my Restoration Angel, flashing it into play, targeting the Arrestor, blinking it, and letting its come into play effect trigger so I can target the Lava Crew. There's a problem with that though. The ability has already been activated and it's already on the stack. It's at this point independent of its source, so I won't be able to stop the ability that's already been put on the stack. However, if my opponent plays a multicolor spell to untap their Lava Crew, it won't be able to tap again if the ability resolves because it's already been detained. So one last thing I want to hit with Detain is that if I detain one of your creatures with Azorius Arrestor and then you kill the Arrestor before your creature naturally becomes undetained, it's still detained until my next turn. And the reason for this is because, just like the Lava Crew, the ability is independent of its source, and will continue to affect that permanent as long as it's still on the battlefield. The permanent that's being affected, not the arrestor. So, with that, let's move on to our next ability, Scavenge. Scavenge is an activated ability that you activate from your graveyard by exiling the creature with Scavenge from your graveyard as a cost. When you do that, you may put a number of plus one plus one counters equal to that card's power on target creature. You can only Scavenge as a sorcery. So, an important thing to note for Scavenge is that it's an activated ability, and the cost of activating that ability is exiling the card with Scavenge. If you want to try to stop it with a card like Cremate, you have to do it before they have a chance to activate the ability. Because once the ability is activated, they've paid the cost, and the card with Scavenge has long been exiled, uh, keeping it out of the reach of Cremate. So, let's take a look at our first example with the new green-black legendary creature from Dragon's Maze. Verils gives all the creatures in your graveyard Scavenge equal to its original mana cost. But what happens if one of the cards in your graveyard has Scavenge already? Do you have to pay the original? Do you have to pay both? Do you have to pay the new Scavenge? Well, you can pay either the new or the old Scavenge cost in order to Scavenge it. And in some examples, it might be beneficial to pay the original Scavenge cost. Such as with Slitherhead. Slitherhead's Scavenge cost originally is zero, but with Verols, it's also a green or black. So in most cases, you want to pay zero instead of actual mana in order to Scavenge it. So, that's all we have for Scavenge. Now let's move on to the Rakdos mechanic, Unleash. What Unleash does is it modifies how a creature enters the battlefield. You may have this creature enter the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it. And, as long as it has that plus one plus one counter on it, it can't block. So, the really important thing with Unleash is that the counter is placed on the card as it's coming into play. It's not placed as a triggered effect, so when it comes into play before anything has a chance to do anything, that counter is already on it. This is important for things like Experiment 1, with no counters on it, and you play a Rectos Cackler, it'll be able to evolve off of that. Or a Gorehouse Chainwalker being played with Unleash on it, there's no point in which your opponent can play Demir Charm to try to kill it. So let's take a look at our first example that's a little weird. Uh, what happens if a creature with Unleash gets a plus one plus one counter on it after it's already blocked? 
So let's say that I attack with one of my creatures and you block with a Rakdos Calculator that does not have any plus one plus one counters on it. And then I want to try to stop it by playing a common bond to give it a plus one plus one counter. Can I do that? And will that stop it from blocking? Well, you can play the spell, but it won't actually stop it from blocking because once a creature is considered blocked, it's considered blocked even if the creature that's blocking it is removed or loses the ability to block. If you want to try to stop it from blocking, you have to play any abilities like that before you give your opponent a chance to block. Now remember, when you play a card with Unleash, you have the option of unleashing it or not. That's totally up to you. And you have the option of unleashing it whenever it would enter the battlefield, whether you cast it or it gets blinked and it comes back into play that way. So now let's move on to Populate. Populate says, put a token onto the battlefield that's a copy of a creature token you control. So an important thing to note is that whenever you populate, you can populate only one token. So for example, if I have a 2-2 knight on the battlefield or a 3-3 centaur, when I populate, I can populate either the knight or the centaur, but I cannot populate both. The next thing to know is that most populate spells will create a token before it populates. This is important because this gives you a chance to create a token no matter what and populate it, so your opponent doesn't have a chance to respond and try to kill the token created by that spell that's creating the token and populating it because it all happens as one continuous resolution of the spell or ability. The last thing to note is that populate doesn't target. And this is important in case you say really early on, oh, I'm going to populate my 8-8 creature, and you respond by saying, well, I'm going to kill that 8-8 token before you have a chance to populate it. Well, then you can populate something else, because you don't actually pick a target, and you choose what you're going to populate as the spell goes to resolve, not when you announce it. Our final mechanic is the is it mechanic overload. Let's take a look at that now. Overload is an alternative cost on certain spells, and what it says is, when you cast it for its alternative cost, you may replace each instance of the word target with the word each. So, Overload is written in a way that it's very easy to replace the word target on the spell with the word each, so that it stops affecting individual things and starts affecting everything. Uh, some important things to note with Overload is, let's say you have a creature that has protection from red or blue on the battlefield, and you play something like Dragon Shift Overloaded. When you do this, the cards with protection will still turn into dragons, and this is because it doesn't actually target them. When you overload something, you never pick targets for the spell. You just affect everything of that particular category that it would affect. Uh, so whenever something becomes a dragon off a dragon shift, it's also important to note that it doesn't become a new object, it just turns into a dragon. So anything that was previously affecting it, enchanted to it, or equipped to it, is still affecting or attached to that card. Uh, another thing relating to protection that's worth mentioning is let's say you have a creature with protection from red, and you play an overloaded Mizium Mortars. Well, in this case, Mizium Mortars' damage will be prevented, not because it targets the card, but because protection is actually going to prevent the damage portion of the spell. Protection prevents from a couple of different very specific things. So with that, let's take a look at some cool examples with Overload. So the first thing I want to point out is that when you overload something, it's being played via an alternative cost. This is important for things like Omniscience. If you overload a spell when you have omniscience in play, you can actually play it for free. Or if you play an overloaded spell with Thalia in play, you have to pay that additional mana cost. Because anything that adjusts the mana cost of a card will adjust the alternative cost of that card as well. Although, if you give a card multiple alternative costs, you have to pick which one you're going to be playing. For example, if you give an overload spell flashback with Snapcaster Mage, you have to pick. Are you flashing it back or are you playing it for its overload cost? And because you can't play an overload spell from the graveyard naturally, you pretty much are only stuck to playing it naturally as it would be with flashback. So you can't overload a card that's being flashbacked via Snapcaster Mage. So the last thing I want to cover is, let's say you play an overload spell, such as Cyclonic Rift for its overload cost, and your opponent counters it with something like Plasm Capture. If this is the case, your opponent, when they get mana back from the capture, is going to be equal to the original cost of the spell, not the alternative cost paid. So they're only going to get back two mana in this case. So this concludes our episode. If you have any questions, send us an email at judgescorner at gatheringmagic.com or leave a comment below. And until next time, remember, it's always good to be punctual, unless you can be fashionably late like me, and have fun.